Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader, and welcome to Nest with Fedora. Uh, this is the second time we've done this virtually. I'm kind of sad about that on one hand. On the other hand, last year, it was the best virtual conference I went to, and I hope that we can again make this the best virtual conference of this year. I'm So I'm excited, and I think Although there's, I, I miss getting together in person, there are some awesome advantages of the virtual format. We can bring so many people from all around the world together here, and so that's cool as well. Um, every year I do a traditional State of Fedora talk where I kind of talk about where we're at, where we've been over the past year, and where we're going, and this is that talk. Um, now I am going to present my screen. Let's see how that technology works today. Look at that, it's amazing. Now, the big downside of this format is I am now just talking to a empty screen by myself with the chat over on the side as the only feedback I get. So keep chatting at me, it makes me feel a little bit less like I'm shouting into a void. Um, and oh, that unshared it because it, my keyboard is focused in the wrong way. Awesome, yay technology. Let's do that again. Okay, yes, what a year. Uh, it has been, um, you know, it's been hard. We've had a lot going on with the pandemic and climate disasters and just everything everywhere. Um, and throughout that, uh, last year, uh, I, I was pretty worried about how we would hold things together in Fedora as a project. And it turns out we've done amazing. It has been a great year with a huge amount of success. Some of the greatest uh, amount of change we've ever had in the project and a lot of good good reviews. Um, this one is from a ZDNet, but it like it was I had a lot to pick from. Um, people really have been happy with our work. So um, and that we're having great impact on the world. That is awesome. Um, yeah, and um, we did, as I said, more change than ever. There were 111 official accepted changes over the last two releases, and you know there was more on the way already. That's a lot. And you know, some of these things were big and scary. I was personally very worried about changing to ButterFS and changing to GNOME 40 because I want to make sure all of our users have a nice, smooth experience. And it turns out we put in the work and did all the QA and testing and engineering, and our users have had a very smooth experience on both of these things. A lot of really positive feedback. Uh, we have an IoT edition now. Uh, KDE is running Wayland. This is really great. But in addition to all of that, uh, there was like more than 200,000 diskit commits over that year. That's that's an insane amount of change, and that's just the packaging change. That's not even considering that each one of those commits or most of those commits represent something upstream that in you know, some software developers have changed and you know sometimes major changes in software that we don't actually go through our change process but still is a lot of change so um it's it's pretty amazing that we have taken all of that and integrated it together into a really nice integrated desktop that people like so much desktop and sorry desktop server uh, all of these use cases that fedora linux covers um and with all of that change, uh, it, it still comes together in a nice polished whole, which is amazing and a, a amazing work of a lot of the people who are listening to me. Uh, so thank you very much for doing this. Uh, we also, uh, in addition to the engineering things like on, on the distro itself, we, we have a lot of work on the project. Uh, so objectives are something that the Fedora Council works on. Uh, Fedora Council is our top level leadership body for the project. And our basically main responsibility is to set up the strategy for long term and medium term things in the project and our medium term strategies are done through a thing called objectives. You can go to the docs page for Fedora Council and kind of read more about this. Uh, we try to pick two to four objectives at a time and they last for about a year as we work on some specific thing. So this last year, um, the two things we're working on are a community outreach revamp and we have we have um, actually sessions about both of these um, that are coming up and you should uh, look for those. Uh, community outreach is uh, 
our our mind share and kind of how we talk about our distribution to new users and new contributors and how we get people onboarded. So there's been it's got a lot of look at that. The Fedora Ambassadors program is getting a revamp and um, so we put a lot of work into that. And then we have a new websites and applications team, which I'm really excited about because a lot of that has been um, some heroic shoestring work of a few people for the last couple of years. So it's nice to have kind of a team building around that again. Uh, so those uh, are progressing nicely. And I've actually talked more a little about those things at the end of the talk here too. Um, there's a lot of things that are really popular. I wanted to particularly call out Ask Fedora, ask.fedorproject.org. This is a community help site, uh, and it's been getting like 250 topics a month. That's actually the actual number, not a rounded off number when I just calculated it yesterday. Uh, and a lot of new posters, new people coming in, a lot of people getting help. This has been really successful. In fact, it is so successful. Uh, we, are, uh, we are doing this as hosted software as a service, and our page limit is 500,000 a month for page views, and we are hitting that. So um, this is a, a good problem to have. We're going to have to upgrade to the next level of service. So uh, that that's a cool thing. Um, we also have a new logo. Thank you to Mo. Uh, we had a, a long design process and an even longer legal process getting this through, but we are now rolling this out. You should see this in you know your Fedora Linux 34 systems um, and on social media, obviously in the slide deck here. We're going to roll that out slowly to other places and the swag that's coming up in the swag pack will include this awesome, beautiful new logo, which in addition to, I think, looking nice and sharp and modern, uh, solves some of the problems. It works in two colors, uh, which we couldn't ever do before, so we can do a lot more things with it. And uh, my personal pet favorite, the, uh, the A at the end, no longer looks like an O from a distance. So hopefully we'll hear less about Fedora O than, than we had before. Uh, and I mentioned that this was a hard year and we did a good job regardless. Uh, that is a lot because of our virtual connections. Obviously, we are always a global online project where we uh, communicate through IRC and web mailing lists and those kind of things. And uh, we we built on that this last year. Uh, obviously, we had the Great Nest Conference and we've done Fedora Social Hour every week. Um, there's more information about that on the Fedora Discussion site or Comblog. Um, you can come join us every Thursday. We just hang out. And generally, the rule is uh, we talk about everything except for Fedora itself. No talking about work, although, of course, sometimes we do break that rule. We also had some amazing virtual release parties, and this is something we are likely to keep doing even when we finally get out of pandemic times. Uh, it was a really good way to bring people together after the release of Fedora Linux 33 and Fedora Linux 34, get everybody to talk about the features and just kind of share our work. And uh, we had a lot of a lot of user attendance at those events as well, not just contributor attendance. And I think that's a really uh, going to be a, a key thing going forward as well. Uh, we'll see. I'm really looking forward to having Flock in person again. Hopefully next year that will be possible and we will probably keep some virtual component as well because of all the advantages of being able to bring in people from around the world. Okay, uh, one of the great things that the outreach objective and the Mindshare team worked on was an actual user survey, something we've been trying to do for a while. And uh, there's, there's actually a session about this as well later, which has some more details. But uh, I'm going to give a few high level things here. About 800 people responded, and about half of those were Fedora uh, contributors, and about half um, said that they were just users and didn't check any of the contributor checkbox. So that's a, 400 responses from each group was a pretty meaningful, good, good survey results there. Uh, and um, let's just jump straight to the exciting slide. Um, this this was the question I, I jumped to right away. How satisfied are you with Fedora overall? And the average for both contributors and users is about 4.2. So really, really positive uh, with some room for growth as well. So this is a really good baseline number. Um, I'm hoping that over the next few years we can move those threes to being fours and fives and move um, so that you know five is the most common number rather than four but um, this is uh, really great to see um, 
We also had a section for write-in comments and about 250 people uh, made write-in comments and these were overwhelmingly positive. Uh, one of the first things I did was go and try and split this by uh, the user and contributors. And I found out that it actually didn't make much difference. The kind of things people were saying um, from both groups was was very similar. Um, and there were just a lot of good comments. I kind of picked these at random, um, but they're very nice. About half of all the comments had, had this kind of sentiment. Um, and uh, another really common theme was the Friends Foundation in specific. People really like the community and you know how we work as a community. That's one of the most important things. Um, one of the comments here was actually a suggestion. So there's room to work uh, on being more inclusive of all people. And that is something we care a lot about. And we do have always, always more uh, room to grow in that area as well. Um, on the more actionable and less good side of things, we actually got quite a few comments um, that were kind of specifically about our project documentation. Now, some of this is about like docs for the distro, but most of it is really about like how to contribute, how to get involved and our communications and just how scattered all of that is. Um, and yeah, that's definitely a problem. Um, it is something that uh, the outreach, uh, bo both of the revamps I talked about are working at and trying to make it easier to get onboarded into different groups in Fedora to find where uh, where a group communicates and find how to plug in. But we are ultimately a really big project. There are about 400 or four, sorry, 4,000 people who do some little bit in Fedora every year and somewhere between 200 and 300 people, a, a rotating cast of 200, 300 people who are active every week. So um, all these different groups uh, have different preferences and we have different technologies. And you can see from the last two quotes here, like some people would prefer us to all be on IRC. Some people would prefer us to not all be on IRC. And uh, it's hard to figure out how to make that all work for everybody, but it's something we definitely need to work on. And um, again, I will talk about that a little bit more in the future here. Um, then there was uh, a, a comment that came up a couple times. So this is just a handful about, about uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it came up more than once and I felt like I need to talk about it. It is keep politics out of Fedora. Uh, this should just be about engineering. And uh, I, I like to make this all fun and not talk about hard topics, but I think there is something worth saying here, especially because the people who ma made these comments also gave Fedora a pretty high satisfaction rating. These are people who care about the project. They're not just negative people, but they're worried about this thing. So I wanted to talk about it. Uh, and I hate to start with the dictionary says as a rhetorical device, but it's important to talk about what politics means. So one you know, uh, definition 1A of politics is basically uh, the system of government in a country and who makes the rules and laws and all of those things. And Fedora is definitely going to keep out of that, except for where it, it um, intersects with uh, actual like free and open source software law. We, we have opinions on that. But in general, like we don't care who you vote for. We don't care what political party, like that's, that's just not any of our business. We don't care. On the other hand, politics has another meaning, a broader one of how people relate to each other in society, who we are, how we talk to each other, how we how we get along. And that actually really is something that's important to us as a project. It is that friends foundation, but it's also key to how open source and free software work. Like we need to have those social relationships and we need to make sure that we are being welcoming to all people. We are being inclusive and we are diverse. Those are things that we need to make happen in order to make the engineering work well. So that is something that is just inherent in the nature of what Fedora is. It is in our values. And so that kind of politics are going to be part of who we are. And I hope that the people who are uncomfortable with that um, come and talk to me. I am I would I would really like to bring you along in this as well, because I think that we have just a lot as a project where this is super important. Um, and so in in these areas, uh, Fedora just is political in that sense of um, a social being a part of a social movement. That's what it is. Um, so, yeah, um, and and I see the comments here. We should be opinionated. Yes, we absolutely are opinionated about these things. Okay, 
So that aside, let's go to my favorite graphs and charts section. Um, this is uh, statistics and uh, this slide here, I promised Smooge that I would put this in every time I show this and I'm going to keep to that. Um, this is not an exact rocket science kind of thing. This is archaeology and, you know, not not very good archaeology with a lot of science to it. We are guessing. So uh, when you see these graphs, take especially the numbers with a grain of gigantic dinosaur bone salt. That metaphor is very mixed. Rar. Yeah, okay, so this is the traditional um, graph using our uh, IP address counting methodology from all time. Um, and this basically, I, I've, it, it's the number of IP addresses, number of systems we see every day, um, unique IP addresses every day. And I've grouped them rather loosely into ages here there's nothing particularly scientific about this either but i felt like it helped it helped us see the trends more than just having them by individual release um, i would like to point at the screen but i don't have a good way to do that um, you can see the green section there is basically when we started fedora next and we had a really huge amount of growth after that which i uh, am really happy with um, and then um, after about five years, that this this orange section here, which I've colored that way, basically based on the slope, we've it's still got really good growth here, but it's not quite as steep as it had been before. Um, so that's something to watch out for. I I like the steeper growth. Let's see if we can we can figure out ways to bring us back to that. Um, this is the same chart for Apple, the extra packages from Fedora for extra packages for Enterprise Linux, which are built from Fedora packages. Um, again, we've got really steep growth here. And this one, we don't see a slowdown. It actually is like a hockey stick curve where if this trend continues, everybody on Earth will be running Apple. So that that's exciting. Um, there are some other talks about this as well and some new stuff going on with, with Apple that is exciting as well. But I just wanted to show that quickly. Um, and then, um, I've got to, we got to switch to the new dinosaurs, the DNF better counting. So we have a new methodology for um, measuring some of the people who are running Fedora, the systems that are running Fedora. And rather than counting IP addresses, this relies on systems themselves checking in with a count me variable and it sends a little bit more information instead of just seeing what repo they hit. We know a little bit about which variant of Fedora Linux they're running and which release and uh, which architecture. Uh, so that can we can do some interesting things with that. I'm going to do more with that in the future. Uh, for now, the the I would show a couple graphs here uh, and uh, talk about them. Uh, so the first thing is uh, the correlation of the old method to the new method. So the dotted line is the old method and the solid line is the new one. You obviously, see that it's a lot higher and that the lines are a little bit correlated here. Um, yeah, and so then I looked at this and then I tried, what if we just double the dotted line? So I'm literally times twoing the value and we get this. And wow, that's a really good correlation. So um, I think that we are not double counting, but again, this is not an exact science. There may be some bugs in here. It is possible that the new method just literally double counts, but it's important to remember that it is actually designed to count more systems. The old system cannot tell if you are running four systems behind one router or if it's just, you know a network address translation router or if it's just one system. So uh, I think it actually may be just that the, the number of systems on average behind NAT is two and it, it comes out to look really much like this, but I don't know that for sure and can't promise it. Um, some of the, the team working on this is going through to make sure that we have no obvious dub double counting here. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's that's an interesting correlation. And at least I can see that the general trend here is that uh, we're, we're getting, um, even if I don't know that these numbers on the left are meaningful as absolute numbers, the actual trend is something that is is useful and something that we can we can base things on it, which is really more important than the absolute numbers anyways. Uh, so one of the things that this can do, because it gives us this number of how, how 
the count me number keeps track of these buckets of whether this is the first week it's checked in, whether it's the it's checked in two to it, the system has been around for two to four weeks, whether it's older than that. So we can break it down into these, and from that I can calculate systems. Uh, basically, the the general number of systems that only show up once and don't show up ever again. I call those ephemeral systems. They're test machines, CI systems, build systems, containers, and those kind of things. So I can separate it this way. It's important to note that since this feature just landed two releases ago, uh, the growth here isn't really absolute Fedora Linux growth. It's growth in systems that are using the new check-in system. That's why there aren't very many 25 plus week systems. So this will be more useful general data, you know, a year or two from now when we have a greater amount of the Fedora systems out there actually running the new code. Um, but uh, anyways, I uh, we can we can definitely break it down into some useful things here, and as time goes on, this will be more useful. And additionally, the uh, the the data from this, not the raw data, but the uh, week by week process data with no IP addresses, all all anonymous, uh, will be available publicly, and you can do your own processing on that. Um, I still got some bugs in my own script, and so I want to get that stuff worked out, and then I will. Um, make a community blog post about it if you're interested in like uh, helping with this and doing more things. Um, one of the things it is, um, like I said, that we can do from this is see which variant people are running. And so this is the breakdown and this is for persistent system systems, which um, are not just there for a week, but which have um, been you know, there for at least a week uh, of the systems that are just new this week. We estimate which ones of them are going to stay around based on the history. But overall, this is systems that are installed and actually running for a long time. You can see um, about half of them are Fedora Workstation and half of them are other things. 20% is Fedora Cloud, which is really quite up from the way, I, way it was a couple of years ago. Um, I think maybe having Fedora, having this in the Amazon marketplace has made a difference here. Um, and uh, yeah, it, that's interesting to see. Yeah, someone asked in the chat, what's the difference between other and generic? So this is reading from the Etsy OS release uh, settings on on your file system. If it doesn't say have a variant there, it gets put into generic. So that will be people who have done like a net install without picking an addition, systems that have upgraded from a long, long time ago, or um, people who have otherwise done custom installs and not set a variant. It is also some of our spins and labs don't actually set that properly yet. So if you are a spin or lab maintainer, talk to release engineering and get that set so that we have that uh, have that in the future. Uh, it is also the case that things that show up at less than 0.1 percent get uh, th those are what get lumped into other here. Uh, and also, um, you see silver blue here at 0.9 percent. Um, we do do counting for RPM OS tree, but uh, I believe something is wrong with that counting because Core OS, IoT, and Silver Blue all show up at much lower than the number of systems I know to be out there. So we're gonna, uh, I, we'll, I expect that number to increase when we figure out what's going on there. Uh, but anyways, the next slide here, uh, switching here, this is the ephemeral system, systems that basically just show up just for, um, one one time and we don't see them again. Um, not surprisingly, 22% of those are container systems. That's um, a, that's yeah. Uh, containers tend to not be long lived. If we go back to the other slide, there are actually uh, you know one percent of them. People are using toolbox containers and things that stay around for a while. But a lot of container usage. Um, overall, so if we look at you know cloud container server usage of the ephemeral systems, it's more than half, which is a, kind of amazing. Um, I'm actually surprised that there were this many ephemeral workstation systems. Uh, I guess those are test systems, CI, and just people playing with things, people playing with the live CD, and they just don't stick around. It could also be people installing it and then disabling the DNF counting, so they're not being tracked again in the future. Uh, again, we don't actually track, but we do. It is accounting, and if you don't like that, you can turn it off. Um, again, we see CoreOS showing up as a tiny amount here. I really believe there is more of it out there than showing. Um, and, uh, but uh, again, cloud cloud up by a little bit, 25% instead of 20 something. But um, as I thought, that's pretty neat to see. 
And here's the breakdown by CPU architecture. Very, very much x86-64 still, but um, the, the ARCH-64, ARM-64 growing by considerable amount. Actually, um, it'll be interesting to see this one over time once we have enough data to really do an over time graph for this. Um, and we see if we look at the ephemeral systems, suddenly there is a bunch of PowerPC and S390X, that's mainframe system. So we see that the people are not really using those for long term running systems very often, but they are doing a lot of building and testing. And this is people, you know, preparing for enterprise releases on these enterprise, these enterprise class hardware. A lot of the work for that happens in Fedora space. Um, there is no x86 showing up beyond 0.1 percent on my chart here there might be some amount but it gets it's down into the noise it's you know. right yes that was a question from the chat there okay uh so that that's the looking at where we are now it is time to look ahead a little bit uh so about 2000 yeah how many years ago is that eight eight years ago my, my goodness, uh, we started doing this thing called Fedora Next. It was the idea Fedora had been around for 10 years. I got this 10 years of Fedora shirt. I'll just stand up and show here, right? Uh, and we've been around for about 10 years, and it was time to think about what did we were going to do for the next decade. And so we did a lot of big rethinking. The Fedora editions came out of that. Um, the idea of having a uh, a base OS and a another ring beyond that, which didn't really come to fruition in Fedora, but is actually there if you look at RHEL. Um, so some of those things from there, uh, as I go back to that graph, like that that green growth, like that came out of Fedora Next, like that doing that rethink and deciding where do we need to be, where do we need to go, was really a huge success. Um, but now yeah, I, the slope is sort of gone a little softer and we are actually you know out of that five years so it's really time to think about what we want to do next where is what's the fedora next next um but that's not a great name um i'm up for a uh, ideas for better things in fedora next next before that sticks uh but these are some of the things that need to be part of this um we need to do a brand revamp that was part of what we did as part of uh as Fedora Next, we came, we came up with a new you know, brand strategy, new icons, new, new logos for the editions, presenting the editions, new Get Fedora web page was developed as part of that. So it's time to look at that again, and not just at the logos, but how we present Fedora as a project, how we talk about it, the project to users, how we talk about the different things that we we put together. Uh, and our different our different outputs and how we how we you know we sell those to people although we don't sell them for money it's the same kind of thing what's our marketing look like for that so we need to look at that um, so uh, but we also actually like we have this websites team revamp that we've been working on it's time for that team to get into action we do want to have new websites we have projects on that progress on that um, and that will kind of reflect this new brand strategy in action uh, both for the user facing pages and then also uh, for the contributor things this this problem that it was raised in a lot of the comments about it's hard to figure out where to start and where to plug into things a new website redesign for project contributors will really help with that as well we also need to rebuild the fedora ambassadors those of us on the ground going out and telling our friends hey Uh, so, uh, yes, we are rebuilding the ambassadors team. That's a super important th thing to happen. It's the people on the ground who are going and telling our friends about Fedora, the project, and about Fedora Linux, the distribution, convincing people to run this. I would really like to see, you know, that that line of users go steeply up. I would like to see there be, instead of you know, 200, 300 people working on Fedora every day, have that be 500 people? That would be amazing. We should have that kind of growth and we're not gonna get that without an active ambassadors team. When I started as Fedora project leader a long time ago, the ambassador team, the project was was kind of in, in, in not in a great state, and I, as early Fedora project leader, did not help with that because uh, I I was looking at some of our costs and thought things like there there was an, an event that the uh, 
the European ambassadors team wanted to run where they were going to have a social where they were doing laser tag. And I was like, laser tag, that is way too much fun to be having. We should spend our money only on things that are really give us a direct return. And that was very short sighted of me. So it's not all my fault, but um, I definitely would like the ambassadors to be fun. I see the value in that now because that bringing together um, groups as teams makes us able to be the project be Fedora and makes uh, us able to convince other people that they want to be part of this. So um, la laser tag is, is go for the future here, everybody. Um, in general, we want to build up the onboarding in Fedora and especially build up mentoring and how we as the project bring other people on board. One of the things I've been talking about for a long time is having a mentorship summit and I would like to still do that. Hopefully we can do that in person. Uh, that'll be something where people who have experience of mentoring in the project share their knowledge and we actually do some training on mentoring. I'm excited about that idea. Um, Kevin Fenzi wonders if there still are laser tag places. Sure, sure, they are definitely, I, don't, don't let my dream die. Um, but overall, uh, we want to make sure we get more people into this awesome project we've got going. Like that's that's the big thing about the next five years of Fedora. We should we should grow everything because it's going so well, um, it's time time to expand. Um, there are some tech parts. I'm going to gloss over this. Um, we should make it easier to package things. It should be more automation. We should have it so that things are happening less where one person who is super knowledgeable does a task that they're they are the expert in and more uh, systems that are doing those things and making it easy for everybody. And uh, we also, uh, I mentioned the, the amazing growth of Apple. That's important, not just because it is our work being used by so many people, but because that is a really key way to draw more people into the project. People uh, get involved with what they use. So we should build up those connections you know, with, with CentOS Stream and with Rocky Linux and Alma Linux and all of our downstreams with RHEL as well. Like that's an important part of growing Fedora as a project. And I'm just going to throw this little bomb out there and, and run uh, modularity. We need something like it, even if it isn't the technology we have today like that. That's part of the technology of growing the future of Fedora. Um, but I'm, I'm open for modularity 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other thing, though, seriously, uh, it has been a hard year and it's been kind of exhausting. And, you know, there's. There's vaccines and things, but we don't really have an end in sight. So this is going to be another hard year, and that's just the reality of it. So let's remember to be extra kind to each other through this next year and in the future, because that friendship and community is like, that's what we are, and that's that's the most important part of it. Um, yeah, finally, thanks to all of our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. And um, does anyone have any questions? Oh my goodness, there is a Q&A over here. Uh, so many. Uh, first question, has Fedora ever written up something to clearly explain the use cases between Fedora Cloud and Fedora Server? Um, the answer is yes. At the beginning of Fedora, uh, the Fedora Next project, we had um, very clear use cases and specific things there. Um, but I think those things have changed over time, and that's something we definitely need to revisit. It's been something I've been interested in revisiting, um, but have not had time because I'm going to blame COVID. But that's something on my agenda for this fall as well, because I think that's really important. Um, Fedora on M1 Mac. Uh, I hope so. Um, we're not really going to invest in enablement as Fedora, and it's not something that's on, say, Red Hat's hardware radar that we can get paid Red Hatters to work on. But as that gets working upstream, um, I, I, hopefully Fedora Workstation will be the, the best thing to be running on an M1 Mac. Uh, I also hope that you know our friends at Lenovo come out with a really sweet high-end ARM laptop uh, that we can have Fedora running on as well. Um, 
will I integrate external system imaging and restoration tools? Um, that was, I, I think, a question asked in the Q&A earlier. Um, I, I think that's a question for some of the different, like Fedora Workstation and those, uh, uh, or Fedora KDE, those different spins, um, because I think that's something that's kind of addressed on a per edition basis for different use cases. Um, Someone asks, uh, they have four systems in their house. They all install update with the same public ID, uh, IP. Um, does, that the, does that affect the old counting and the new better counting count that better? Yes, exactly. So in the old counting, we just see, oh, there's one IP address coming in for the mirrors today. Uh, and we count it one time. In the new system, sometime at random during the week, each one of those systems reaches out and says, hey, count me. So we get four count me's during during the week, um, so we can tell the difference there. Um, are there roadmaps for access, uh, improving accessibility? Um, yeah, uh, so I know that GNOME in particular cares about accessibility. And so, uh, although I don't think we have any particular accessibility initiatives in Fedora as a project right now that are active, our upstreams care about that. And I would I would love to love to hear more about what we could do and possibly do some better testing in Fedora and bring that back to our upstreams as user needs. Uh, that's a really important thing that I would, would love to see us do more of. Uh, will there be a virtual release party for Fedora 20, Fedora 25, Fedora 35 in October? Absolutely. We will do virtual release parties from now until the end of time, as far as I can tell. Uh, we will, uh, that will be a, a great way to celebrate what we've done, bring, show, show off the changes and bring more people in. Um, does the new counting uh, say something about how often systems update? No, it does not tell me how often systems update. Um, it just tells me the, the only the only time data is uh, whether they've been around for um, those certain buckets of time, and it's not very granular. Um, I would like to have that kind of information, but I think that in order to do that, we're going to have to have a kind of more opt-in information gathering thing that will let people give us more data, which we could possibly use um, uh, that might not be as easy to keep uh, anonymous as the sort of broad strokes uh, that we have in the current system. Okay, uh, Dusty tells me that the DNF counting is not enabled by default in CoreOS yet. Um, so that explains why it's not showing up very much. That's very helpful. Um, are we getting an official Fedora in Windows subsystem for Linux? Not that I can see, because uh, the way Windows subsystem for Linux works is basically you get your distro into the App Store, Microsoft App Store as an application, and Red Hat Legal feels that we cannot sign the agreement required to get into the App Store because of liability and other concerns that were just showstoppers. Um, I feel like this is really unfortunate. Um, because honestly, like this is open source, Microsoft could just take it and put it in their app store right now if they wanted to, but they do not want to do that. They want us to do that and to assume the liability. So we're at a stalemate there. Um, there is an unofficial remix that is in, um, in the app store that some other company decided that they were willing to take on that risk. So you can get Fedora there. Um, I, I would like to see us get somewhere on this, uh, but I don't see it happening without Microsoft changing their general approach to making it less like Fedora is an app that runs on Windows, which is really not what, what we want anyways. Um, I don't have a clock here. Um, could someone tell me how much more time we have? <gasps> Okay, plenty of time then. Uh, I'll keep doing Q&A. Um, so uh, one question here, what is CoreOS and does CoreOS have a GUI? CoreOS is uh, it, a 
operating system designed for containers. And it uses a technology called RPM OS tree to, to basically manage your operating system like you might manage a project with Git. So instead of having uh, RPM based updates, you do a checkout of a certain point in time that's kind of managed by the project so that if you use those checkouts, every core OS system has the same code on it. With the traditional way of putting together things with packages, after you know, a year of running, any single Fedora Linux system is probably a unique entity with a different combination of packages and software than another one, um, which then can make debugging and diagnostics complicated. So CoreOS is basically meant to have a uh, fixed base operating system and then run things on containers on top of it. The second part of the question is, does it have a GUI? No, its goal is basically running in the data center, running uh, Kubernetes or something like that on top of it. But we have a thing called Silverblue, which uses the same technology to to deliver a GNOME desktop experience, and also a thing called Kinoite, which is for KDE. And I believe we have talks about those things as well. Uh, which Fedora release was the best? The answer there is Fedora Linux 34, of course. Um, it is always the latest. I know you just said cannot answer the latest, but really it keeps getting better and better over time. That's, uh, that's the way it is. Um, let's see. Uh, where can we download this session? Uh, this will be available on YouTube and possibly somewhere else afterwards. Right now, it is. Um, it, it, it takes us a little while after the event to process all this, but all of the talks will be available online. Um, uh, someone asks, when to use Fedora Project, Fedora Linux, and then different names like the Workstation or Silverblue. Um, we're working this out. This is part of the brand strategy thing I was talking about. I like to use Fedora to refer to the project and to the community. It's kind of like uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is the distribution and Red Hat is the company, or you know, Microsoft Word is the word processor and Microsoft is the company. Fedora is the project. Fedora Linux is what we make, as well as you know, Fedora Workstation, Fedora Server, those kind of different um, editions, variants products, if you will, although um, they are, as Red Hat Legal would, uh, and Marketing would like to remind me, not actually products because we do not sell things here in our community space. Um, there's a question, is there a place for Fedora to focus on VDI tools? Um, VDI is virtual, I, I don't remember what that stands for, but virtual desktop, remote desktop, cloud desktop kind of things. Um, I, I don't know if anybody focusing on that right now, but that would be an interesting project um, and something w worth looking at. Yeah, uh, so someone asked if the number of contributors is increasing. Uh, it is generally steady. It, it, is several thousand every year doing some little bit of things, including you know uh, an answering questions on Ask Fedora, making docs edits, those kind of things, um, even you know, asking answering questions on IRC. Th those things are, are contributions, uh, and those is some something like in the thousands. Uh, if you look at people who are contributing every week, the kind of people who are there. Uh, around more than just stopping in every now and then. It's more like two to 300 people. It's not always the same two to 300 people, but that, that's kind of the core. And that has been steady for the last, really since we've been measuring it, 10 years or so. Uh, and I would love to see that grow, but it's been pretty constant. Um, let's see. Can I remove the GNOME Classic session. I don't know. I don't know if you can remove that. Um, are there consequences of removing it? Um, probably not. It's basically just a bunch of GNOME extensions that kind of give you a task bar and some of the things people are more familiar with from older releases of GNOME. Um, I guess for, for me, hard, hard disks are big enough that I don't really worry about a few extensions there that aren't active, but um, you can probably figure that out. I, I think you can probably remove it. I don't know. Um, what is the most exciting recent technology that Fedora is adopting? Um, 
I, I think that probably for a desktop use case, Pipewire is is the most exciting thing. Um, it's really kind of redoing how we do audio and making it easier to use things like flat packs uh, for putting for distributing applications and uh, can handle video and can handle low latency audio as well. So it's probably pro probably the big desktop technology that that's exciting. Um, um, mentorship is a great, and for understanding the Fedora project, what are some mentorship programs right now? So we do some internship programs. We do Outreach E, which came out of the GNOME Outreach Program for Women. We do that every year. Um, and then we also have the Fedora Join group, which isn't necessarily a mentorship group directly, but can help you get involved in the project and can help you find mentors and find people who can help you with things. So Fedora Join is probably the strongest place to start with right now. Uh, someone asks, are they saying that Fedora 34 server works great on their Raspberry Pi and where's the best place to share their experience? I think Fedora magazine would be a great place. Uh, so that's somewhere that anybody can write an article about something in, in the Fedora project, in Fedora Linux, something cool that they've done and show how to do it. Uh, I think that would be a really good place, especially if you have like some things, you know, that you've had to figure out and you can show how you did it. Um, that that's that's a great place to show off. Um, you can also add if it's sometimes a little more how to focused, you could go to the Fedora Quick Docs. Um, that would be a, a great place for those kind of things. How well has Fedora Magazine been doing on viewership? Do you know what? I don't know offhand. I hadn't actually looked. I should check. Um, I know that for years it has been kind of going up and up and up, um, and it is it is very popular. Uh, it is one of the most uh, most popular blog platforms that o OSAS keeps track of, or OSPO, sorry, the um, Red Hat's uh, open source program office keeps track of, um, and it is a really, it's a really good way to get um, things out to a lot of people, but I don't have the exact numbers offhand here. Uh, maybe somebody else does. Um, someone asks whether Fedora uh, Workstation works on the Raspberry Pi 8 gigabytes. Uh, the answer is yes, probably. Um, Raspberry Pi is always a hard and difficult moving target because the Raspberry Fi Pi Foundation really is focused on their own particular goals of their own product and their own integrated you know, Raspbian operating system and their own educational goals and um, does not really push all of those things upstream in a way that makes them flow directly into Fedora Linux, which makes it really difficult. So uh, honestly, if you are looking for a single board computer to run Fedora Workstation on, something like this is a better choice. Uh, that's the uh, NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Let's make this the final question here. Uh, how's the website and apps team revamp going that I mentioned? Uh, it's going very well. And there is a session later today, I think, or maybe tomorrow. Check the schedule on that. That can give you very de details for that. Oh, wait, no, here's one more that I should definitely cover. This will be my last one. Uh, will the respins be mentioned in the new website? It makes too much sense to have an updated ISO and not just update after installing. Um, I would really like to see the respins integrated into our general release engineering process and have them produced automatically. Uh, right now, um, the respin SIG has heroically been doing that and they are kind of unofficial, but I would like to see those be made official and made those made available on, on the official websites for sure. I think that would be really useful. And with that, thank you everybody. I will see you around the rest of this conference.